So look, if you want to grow your wealth, your income, and increase the amount of time off, then these are the shortcuts that can help. Welcome to the Wealth Creation Podcast. And good morning, everybody. It's Dan Lotto speaking. Hope you're well today. So today, I don't know what day it is. Wednesday, probably Wednesday. Uh, so today we're going to talk about average yields. We're going to talk about property again, like we did yesterday. Uh, we're property-minded at the moment for some reason. Oh, I know why the reason is. It's because we're coming up to the 20th year of being in property. I kept thinking I've been in property longer than I actually have. And uh, I kept saying, oh, I've been in property over 20 years. And actually, I haven't. It's 20 years in March. Uh, the very, very first house that I bought, uh, we still have. Uh, it, we bought it at 40. It went all the way up to 200. According to Zoopla, it's worth like 160 now. But I think it might be worth 170, 180. But anyway, who knows? It went up and then it came down. Um, so it hasn't quite recovered from the, the top uh, but the location where it is, is Headingley, which we'll talk about in a minute as that happens. Uh, and Headingley is a really big student area in Leeds. And uh, well, we'll talk about it now. And so what's happened in Headingley is that a lot of private landlords have moved out because a lot of um, purposely built uh, rental blocks have come in and it's changed kind of a landscape, uh, really. Uh, someone put it's a cool. How did they describe it? Um for the highest yield, look within the LS6 postcode, 7.43%. This area includes Headingley, a cool suburb with good commuter links to both universities. I'm not quite sure how cool that is, considering uh, I lived on the most burgled street in the UK. Um, I can't remember its name now. Uh, but I lived on that street for a, a couple of years, and it was just the, the most burgled street. I remember seeing a picture in a Daily Mirror or Daily Mail or something, uh, and it had a picture, and it had my little MG. I had a little MG midget, a little yellow one, which I bought years and years ago. Um, like, literally, when I first started um, buying property, that's I rented it all out, and then I moved into certain... Oh, no, it was before I bought my first house. It was, like, 20-odd years ago. Anyway, I mean, I had a picture of my little MG, little bright yellow MG. It was really cool. Anyway, so let's talk about yields. Let's talk about stuff all up and down the country. Let's also talk about what a yield actually is. So, uh, for me... A yield is a poor performance indicator as to how well your property is going to do. Uh, and, and so yields do kind of wind me up a little bit. Like, But it's an indicator, okay? Uh, the better indicator when you're first buying a property is return on investment. But the return on investment it, it kind of indicator is also flawed. And it's flawed because when I bought that first house 20 years ago, so return on investment is how much money are you putting in and what's the return that you're getting out? So if you put in, uh, let's use easy numbers. Let's let's say if you put in ten thousand pounds in, okay, and you're making six thousand pounds profit after all your costs, then your return on investment is sixty uh, percent. You're getting a sixty percent return. Like those just don't exist. You might be uh, putting tw- uh, let's do an easy one. Um, let's do forty thousand pounds. I'm going to struggle on my maths here. And let's say you're getting a £10,000 return. That's a 25% return on investment. That's great in year one. That's wonderful. But what happens 20 years in? You know, the property that I had uh, 20 years ago that I bought for 40 grand, well, my investment on that, well, it was two and a half grand deposit. Woohoo, 5% deposits in those days. And then I had some legal fees. That probably cost a grand, okay? So we're talking three and a half grand down. I've remortgaged that. That one property is probably responsible for a large part of my portfolio because we just remortgaged it. We bought the next one, we remortgaged that. We bought the next one, we remortgaged that. I couldn't have done any of those without this first one. So return on investment is such a poor way. Uh, sorry, it's a good indicator in your first year, but it's a poor way over the long term to work out what the return on investment is. There's a good chance it's likely in the millions or certainly uh I was going to say, actually, it's likely it's possible. It could be infinite because I'm getting an infinite return on that. Probably not quite infinite, but it's more likely that it's millions over a period of time. Because what happens if we keep it for another 20 years and then we put it in a trust and then we pass it on to our kids and our grandkids and our grand, 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 grandkids? How does that all work? So, well, it, it does, but it doesn't tie into your return on investment figures. So, like, these people analyze and overanalyze, I'm putting this money in, And, oh, it's going to take me 10 years to get a return. I'm not going to do that. That's just crazy. Well, it's going to take me 30 years to get a return. It doesn't matter. You're thinking too analytically. It's one of the things we were touching on yesterday is that your analytical mind can't cope, shouldn't cope with that kind of stuff because it doesn't know what the return on investment is going to be. Yeah, you might have numbers on a spreadsheet, but ultimately over the next 20 years, you don't know what the return on investment is going to be. 
what if I go on a training course on uh, yoga, right? And it costs me £500 and I've been doing yoga for the rest of my life. What is the return on investment on that? It's just impossible to calculate. Fine, we've got no numbers in, in yoga, but if we had a property, let's say I've got an investment and I buy Bitcoin, okay? I bought at 20, let's say, I didn't, 20 grand. But let's say that's what I bought. It's now worth, what, three or four? And then you think, oh, wow, well, in, in this year I've lost, I've made a massive loss, a 75% loss on that. Well, what if you hang on to it and you hang on to it for another 20 years and it goes up and it's worth 100 grand? It's all very subjective. Time is a great healer when it comes to investing. Um, I was thinking in the shower earlier, Robert Allen, who said, don't wait to buy property, just buy property and wait. Unfortunately, he went uh, bankrupt through his property stuff, but I think he was just playing the game too close to the line, basically. And then when the financial crash hit, and obviously. So uh, return on investment is a, a, a another indicator, a, a better one than yield, because uh, at least you, it's got actual physical numbers rather than percentages. Percentages don't mean anything. Oh, I've got a 50% bonus today. Brilliant. How much are you on? Two pound an hour. You only on pound an hour, uh, three pound an hour before? My maths is terrible today, but you know what I'm you know what I'm saying, right? So so oh I've got a five percent pay rise today. Great. How much do you earn um did you earn before? A million pounds. Oh wow, so you got a fifty gram pay rise, yeah. See the difference? So yields are based on percentages, return on investments based on actual true numbers, but it only takes into account the first couple of years on those numbers. And then after that, when you start remodeling, pulling stuff out, paying it down, using the money from your, your um, tenants increases your credit rating you can refinance it you can put more money out, whatever right so there are the two differences between return on investment so yield yield is simply how much rent do you get and how much was is the asset worth okay so then like and i don't know the answer to this but what if you buy an asset it's worth 100 and now it's worth 200 but you've not refinanced it and you're not doing anything to it is your yield just cut in half let's say rents haven't haven't changed at all I don't know what even the answer is to that. Now, some people will say, no, your yield should be based on today's value. Well, it doesn't work. If it's stacked up a year ago, let's say it's a 20% yield on a £100,000 property. Uh, or actually, let's say, let's say, um, let's say, uh, let's say 6% yield on a £100,000 property. Let's say it's that, because that ties it. 6% yield on a £100,000 property. If it goes to £200,000 property, is that now a bad deal? You've already, you've already got a mortgage for it. You've already paid the deposit. You've already paid all the tax and all the money to get into the deal, all the uh, solicitor's fees and so on. Why is that now suddenly a bad deal? So yield for me just doesn't – it's an indicator, and that's all it is. Uh, I, I remember seeing in uh, um, one of the newspapers um, that I don't read – uh, uh, something about Sheffield being the, Sheffield City Centre being the best for yield, and it's like, <clears throat> but what if your service charge is two hundred and fifty pounds? I've got service charges with two hundred and fifty quid at least, by the way. Let's say it's one hundred and fifty pounds on a five hundred pound studio. Like, how, it's taking one hundred and fifty quid. It's taking a, a, what is that thirty percent um, of your income just on uh, service charges? But that's not taken into account on yields. That will be taken into account on the return on investment. So you've got to use both of these. Uh, and if you if you still don't understand these figures after me speaking to them about them, that's fine. Go check it out on um, uh, Morning Imran. Go check it out on uh, Google or Facebook and that kind of thing. So, but let's go through the yields because I, I, I did a search yesterday because I was interested in knowing what my actual yields were and what they're compared with. But then I ran into this problem of my portfolio that it was worth when I bought each individual house compared with my portfolio's value today affects the yield. So, and, and how much a house is worth is very, very subjective. Uh, I did a search on Zoopla yesterday for a house I own. It said it was worth 132, I think it was. And it's like the house next door sold for 170. So, like, I don't understand where Zoopla gets its information from per se. No idea. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yields don't really help you too much, but let's just take a look at some of them. Um, it's saying uh, universities are lucrative for landlords. I would suggest that's about to change. If it's a new university, like the one in Lincolnshire, and that's new as in it's it's less, it's like 10 years old, I I, I'm guessing, um, then maybe so. But for the like Manchester and like Leeds, those yields are coming down. My uh, properties in, um, I've got properties in Headingley in Leeds, which is a big student area. Those yields are definitely coming down. 
um, and prices of house prices are coming down too as it happens because people are moving into purpose-built student blocks and if you've got a uh, back-to-back terrace and you compete with a student box you might have a few problems there and if you've only got one but I've got to talk about the no- quantities of property if you've got one buy to let property you're going to have problems you, you're just going to have tenants that don't pay and then you're 100% um, n- um, no rent across your portfolio whereas if, if one of my tenants doesn't pay it's in the low percentage point in, in terms of uh, how that affects the entire portfolio, it doesn't make much of a difference. If you've got two or three and two are empty and one's paid, you've got problems, do you know what I mean? And if you've got one student place, you've got problems because the way to rent student houses out are uh, you either go through an agent or you, you advertise it yourself on, on right move, but it's so much harder because you have groups of students and they put them in the back of a minibus and then they drive them around to different houses. And if you've only got one house, it just causes more problems. Uh, but only having one of anything causes problems. Only having one house causes problems in case one burns down. Only having one car is one problem in case one breaks down. Um, only having one buy to let property is a problem in case the person doesn't um, pay their rent on time and refuses to move out. So you just have to take that into account. Anyway, let's let's just run through some numbers for you. Nottingham, two universities. Uh, it's got the largest, uh, one of the largest UK Student populations, 30% of the population aged 18 to 29. That's amazing. Uh, <clears throat> Nottingham Trent University has an average yield of 11.99%. I mean, how amazing is that? That's really good. Uh, I don't know how, um, obviously, 2018, 2019, so it is very recent. So Nottingham, 12% yield. Uh, NG7 postcode, 8.89. These are great yields. Uh, Liverpool, some more really good yields. All of these are in the top yields, by the way. So L7, uh, average yield is 9.79%. Anyone who's in Liverpool, Edge Hill, Fairfield, Kensington, close to Liverpool's three universities. I was going to say these are all university areas. Uh, but high crime, high turnover tenants, a lot of maintenance from other student parties uh, that I never went to. Uh, uh, <laughs> we didn't get crash student parties dressed as roundheads at all. Um, yeah, L1, 9.3%, L6, 7.85%. What about Manchester? That's interesting. Um, I've got some units in Manchester. M14 ranks the 18th overall with an average yield of 7%. Uh, that's Fallowfield, Mosside, Lady Bound, Rush Home, uh, Victoria Park. M13, 6.89. Uh, Leeds, which is where most of my portfolio is. The highest yield, look at 7.43% in the LS6 postcode. That's the student area. Includes Headingley of Cool Suburb with commuter links for both universities. My portfolio consists of stuff in the city centre and stuff on the suburbs. Northeast. I love how we have Nottingham, that's a specific place. Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds, all specific places. And then you've got the Northeast. <clears throat> it's like when you're on the M1 and you're coming up north and you see an arrow that says the north, but when you're going down south, it says London. It doesn't say the south. It really winds me up. Uh, if, if you're wondering about north-south divide, if you know, that's it right there. If it was a, a hashtag me too for um, uh, location uh, prejudice, uh, it's right here, the northeast. Uh, buy select investments in the northeast have the luxury catchment students in popular cities like Newcastle and Pontine, York and Durham. Uh, I'll get over the prejudice. Uh, any one postcodes are close to Newcastle. Uh, properties here cost around 161, have an average yield of 8.16%. Not bad again. Any six ranks sixth. Um, okay, then we've got a table of the best buy to let. So let's have a look for the South. I'm not going to call it London anymore. We're just going to call it the South. See how you guys like it. Oh, my gosh. Really being my bonnet. South End on Sea. That must be somewhere in the South. 8.2%. 8.02%. That's really good. Bradford, 8%. That's where you can buy a a house for 50p. Uh, Liverpool. I've got got units in Bradford. (laughs) By the way. Uh, 7.85, so these are averages, uh, Cleveland 7.66, Sunderland 7.53, Huddersfield 7.5. Do you know, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my property portfolio was not buying in Huddersfield, just where the Zetland pub was. There was a couple of houses just towards the bottom of that, right next to the university, and there were four beds at 40 grand. And I was researching them, and I, was, I, I went to Huddersfield Poly for six months, 
and I was researching these units, and you know, I never bought. And the yields on those right now would be amazing. Oh, if you could go back 20 years and change what you bought into, it uh, would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, so the lowest one on this, on the top 25 is 6.8, Aberdeen 6.2, uh, uh, 6.82, Sheffield 6.8, Cardiff 6.8. Uh, I'm trying to find some that we've not talked about. Okay, rental yields continue to be low in London, or I should say down south. Worst buy to let areas, London. Okay, Southgate. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> Southgate, 2.16%, uh, sorry, 2.6% in Southgate. N14, Kensington 2.57, Muswell Hill 2.55. Goodness gracious me. Lambeth 2.5, Paddington 2.5. I don't know why I'm so surprised by yields. It's because I'm a northerner. Chelsea 2.4, Highgate 1.9. But they all invest for capital growth. And let's just talk about capital growth versus rental income. I don't invest for capital growth. Has that harmed my portfolio? Probably to some extent. Uh, but has my. Cash flow allowed me to retire young. So I'm 46 now and I retired a long time ago from having to do work per se. So has that allowed me to do that? Yes. All our income comes in. It covers all our costs. It allows us to live here in Spain. It's 25 degrees next week, by the way, which we're looking forward to. Um, best buy to let on areas in London. There are some. Uh, East Ham, 4.8%. Uh, Hammersmith, 4.47%. Stratford 4.45, Playstore, Poplar 2 in Chingford, Hampstead, all in the four, four percenters. The worst UK postcodes for buy-to-let yields are all down south. <laughs> okay, so Bournemouth 2.37, Watford 2.34, Bournemouth 2.3, Doncaster. Uh, this is DN22. I've got a property in DN21. It says average asking price 252000 The average asking price for mine is like 40 grand. <laughs> I've got a property there. It is a tip. Uh, and the only the only thing I keep thinking about doing is buying that street and the next street and the next street and hiring a security guard, uh, stroke gardener, stroke landscaper to come in and put flowers in there and then manage it with CCTV because it's such a... Uh, it's been burgled so many times. It's just ridiculous. Um, Wakefield, WF2, 2.27%. Uh, I, I have my doubts about that. Bolton... BL7, of the average house price there is 370000 So anything with a high um, amount will have a low yield. So, like, that one in Wakefield at 282000 you're probably getting, what, £1,000? I oh, no, it says average monthly rent value, £535. Well, it's just completely not even accurate, that. Like, how can you only get 500 quid for a house worth two hundred eighty grand in Wakefield? That's just... Um, oh, this data, by the way, comes from totallymoney.com, and I would say some of it must be inaccurate. Like Bolton, £370,000 is the asking price, average monthly rent is 701 So that's got to have, no, I, I just don't even know how it works out, I, I just don't know. Um, and then it's got Bradford, BD23, I'm guessing these areas that it's talking about are in really bad, poor areas. Um, with a lot of housing benefit and that kind of thing. They tend to be in the low-priced areas. Uh, but interesting, isn't it? Now, how accurate are these figures? <clears throat> Having gone through some of those, I'm not, I'm not convinced how accurate these figures are, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, um, it's an indicator, an approximation that's designed to... Oh, lots of people on. Uh, morning, Graham. Morning, uh, Neil and Julie. Neil and Julie. Um, so... This is all dependent on what you've got going on, basically. Like, what are you investing for? Are you investing for capital growth? Are you investing for cash flow? Or we're cash flow investors through and through, right? We Very rare do we invest for capital growth. We've got some bigger um, penthouse stuff in Leeds City Centre, but the yields aren't great on those, um, and it actually brings my average yield down. Uh, my average yield is between... Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, just for legal reasons, actually, because um, uh, there are always solicitors watching. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my average yield, so the best one was Nottingham with an 11.2%. It's less than, or 12%, it's less than that, uh, but it's higher than Leeds of 7.43%, somewhere between those. But my big city centre penthouse stuff, that really brings that yield 
uh, down quite a lot. They're worth maybe 300,000. We're pulling in maybe 1,200 a month on those. Uh, so we do the yield on that and just work out what that is. So if you if you want to know how to do the yield, it's 1,200 pounds. Times that by 12. Let's grab the calculator. 1,200 pounds. Whoops. Uh, get rid of that. 1,200 uh, times 12 divided by 300 is a 4.8% yield. So it's a terrible yield. Well, I think that's a terrible yield. If you're in London on those 2.3% uh, yields in Hammersmith, you probably think that's, that's an amazing yield. Uh, but rent's uh, low on that one. The rent should be about 1,400 on that one, but we, we dropped the rent um, for the tenant on that one because we're nice. So anyway, look, take these yields with a pinch of salt, but use them as an indicator for something that you can compare and contrast your own portfolio with. So it gives you an idea, but that is literally all it is because yields – Ain't worth the paper it's written on. It's just not worth it. It's just made up bullshit. Like, how much is a house worth? Like, the three hundred thousand pound house. How much is that worth? Uh, the, the penthouse in Leeds. Is it worth three hundred? Is it worth five hundred? Or is it worth one hundred and fifty? Is it worth a hundred? Like, like who knows? Who's to say? And what? What's a rental? Like, how much is a rental worth? A rent is worth whatever we can get out of a tenant, right? Market rent. I don't know what market rent is. I don't know who sets it. Nobody sets it. It was the market sets it. That's why it's called market rent. It's just it's just made up. Everything's just made up. I've not got any money on me. Like my, in my uh, economics class when I was in high school, I've only got euros on me, but I've got a euro here. Okay, so there's my euro, and he would always get his money out and go put it on a table, and he go, and he's Scottish. I'm not going to do a Scottish accent. But go, and he's Scottish, which means he's tight, right? Just to use, we're in stereotypes today. So hopefully we've just offended all the Scottish people watching and listening. Uh, <laughs> if a further up north you go, the tighter you get. Uh, Yorkshiremen are pretty tight too. Anyway, he throws money on the table and go, how much is that worth? And we go, uh, we can't, it's worth £5.60. And he'd be, no, it's worth the price of the, uh, the cost of goods that it allows you to buy. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's probably one of the reasons I never liked the guy. Uh, but I respect him for the throwing his money out on the table uh, every every time we had a lesson. I mean, it, it talk about is is doing um, tutoring after school, but not put it on the books. <laughs> and him to come out and say it. Oh, those were the days. Eh? So, um, so like, how much is stuff worth? The stuff is worth the cost of what it will buy you, right? So, like, like, listen to this. This is. This is really good. If you've got this far in the podcast, right, you've got to love this. If you're getting a 10% yield on a flat in Leeds City Centre, let's just say, right, that 10% yield, the money that that represents, will buy you whatever the cost of stuff is worth in the UK. But if you don't live in the UK, if you live in Spain, where coffee costs one pound, one euro fifty, which is like one pound thirty, maybe one pound twenty, is it a 10% yield? <laughs> This is one of those, if a tree falls down and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? If a yield is 10%, but you live in uh, Thailand or the Philippines, and the coffee is like 50p, and a pint's 50p, and your rent is 300 quid, and do you know what I mean? And your food is, you know, you go for a meal out and it's like 8 quid. Like, is it still a 10% yield? Well, technically, yes, it is, but it's only based on where you live. Like, you can go live in a lot more luxurious places than Wandsworth and... Leeds and Wakefield with that terrible yield of 2.2%. I saw a, um, a post yesterday and someone was saying it was a two-bed flat. It was in a high-rise with in like a, an old ex-council with washing out and it was £2,000 a month rent. And I'm like, £2,000? You can rent a villa next to a beach for €1,000 here where we live and you're living in, in that? Well, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but anyway, look, there are some really good uh, ideas about yield there, some really good ideas about return on investment and some really good thought-provoking stuff. The cost of m the value of your money is what it will buy you, uh, not what somebody else says it's actually worth. All right, I hope that's useful for you in today's podcast. We will catch up with you in tomorrow's podcast. My name is Dan Latter. Take care. Hey, it's Dan here. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate each and every one of you. Please click like or subscribe to the entire podcast.